I just need to provide some context. I don't really want you to provide you with a history um, of my life, but it will provide you, hopefully, with an understanding and appreciation in terms of some of my anecdotal comments and observations. So you've heard I spent five years undertaking a, a BSc building management, and I then completed an MSc and a PhD. So along with Dries Hartflisch, I have four degrees in construction management. I was an MNR EP bursary student, so I grew up in the 80s in the traditional format as such, and I was developed as a construction manager. I worked during vacations, my first June, July back, 80 cents an hour, uh, nine hours per day as a shutter hand, a deck hand, and a team leader. And I worked in various departments, such as planning, um, purchasing accounts and surveying. And during my fourth and fifth years of study, I worked as a construction management trainee for MNR EP, obviously, and I managed the Holiday in Summer Strength project in fifth year. I actually worked as a construction surveyor, and of course, who better than a construction manager uh, after graduating? And I ended my contracting career on the 31st of May 1990. And in fact, I lectured part-time in 88, 89 at the then University of Port Elizabeth and migrated to academia on the 1st of July. But yes, my experience in terms of the discipline, profession and practice of construction management has its roots in the fact that I was a student member of the SAIB from 1981 to 84 and moved on to become the president during the period March 96 and uh, April 98. Because I specialize in construction H&S, many of my presentations have an H&S flavor. Our industry has experienced numerous failures of management. Many of you refer to them as accidents, but of course an accident's an unplanned event. And of course, when you don't undertake certain interventions, you planning an event. So therefore, accidents, according to you, are in fact failures of management. And I hope you educate your students accordingly. The Investex office uh, complex scaffolding collapse is cited as a success despite the three dead bodies. And of course, when people refer to cost, quality, time and utility, then you know they're virgins because those are just four uh, project parameters, but in fact they're 11. <coughs> My favourite uh, failure management is courtesy of the Inyaka Bridge collapse, July 1998, generated 14 dead bodies, 7 Concor and 7 VKE. That's what happens when you don't manage construction. A further amplification for the need of professional construction management. Never insert bearing pads in the wrong direction with casual workers, not a good idea, among other. But why is this particular failure of management so profound? In 1999, I went on sabbatical and used the opportunity to deliver dedicated construction management career promotions. And it was during one such career promotion, namely at the Collegiate Girls High School in Port Elizabeth, which is a notable school, along with its brother, that is, Grade High School, which I attended. And at the end of the presentation to the Grade 10 scholars at Collegiate Girls High School, the first question raised was, but Professor, aren't there a lot of accidents in your industry? So just put that in the forefront of your mind as the presentation unfolds. And then the Kuka Bridge collapsed, another notable one, and of course the client and the engineers are in trouble because this was uh, post promulgation of the construction regulations on the 18th of July 2003. And there's some notable um, observations, some toothpick bracing over there. We've got another little toothpick over there. And of course uh, they're not at 45 degrees and uh, it's not pervasive. And there are a number of numerous other uh, faults with this said support work and form work, referred to as scaffolding by the way. 
There were 50 people working on the deck. Two died and 48 were injured. Another failure of management. After the said collapse, the landside manager, the Cooker Development Corporation, said to me, John, but there were three PR engines on the job. So I said to him, so what? And of course he turned grey, white, grey, white, and maybe grey again. Um, as you see, engineers work with formula. But professional construction managers need to be able to make a qualitative assessment. When you arrive on site and you observe that abortion, then you need to stop the job. But there's not a formula to tell you if it's going to collapse or not collapse. There are processes that need to be followed. And of course, that was the cherry on the top, the top scaffolding safe for use. A profession makes use of a common vocabulary. Our profession, construction management, refers to it as support work. But I must say, technically, they were correct because it was scaffolding. And that was why it collapsed, one of the reasons. It wasn't support work. But we use a common vocabulary in our profession. Why is construction so backward? I advocate that each and every educator here acquire that title and read it. Verha isn't an ably. It's enlightening. And it doesn't only refer to construction, but to design, procurement, and construction. And of course, my friends, the architects and engineers, never fail to amuse me. And having specialized in designing for construction h &S, over a period of time, I first worked in that area in 1995, I focused there on. Now, that photograph was taken on the Canal Walk project in 2000. At the inception of the project, the project value was 1,000 million, 1 billion rand. And there you'll note a 210-litre drum. Obviously, someone had cut the lid off. Obviously, the right drum, because if they'd cut the lid off the wrong drum, it would have exploded. And they positioned it on bricks, and they're making a fire underneath it to heat up mastic asphalt. Now, associates, delegates, etc. Can you imagine BMW, seeing we're up here, putting a 210-litre drum on bricks on their factory floor to melt a coating to apply to the underside of your BMW 320? Absolutely not. So we need to realize that there's a very big picture here. It's not just about our discipline and the so-called inability to attract people, but those designers, the architects, engineers, landscape architects and interior designers, that create a lot of problems for our discipline on site, not just with inadequate information, but ambiguities, late, um, incomplete, whatever. But it's what they actually do specify that results in the creation of an environment that is not conducive to Y generation people. And there we go. Courtesy of the May the 28th edition of 2007, by the way, of Fortune. And in fact, I sent this article to a number of people, among other Mike van Royen, who I think is still going to address the summit. And this, folks, is what we are dealing with. The question is, do they want to manage mastic asphalt being melted in 210 litre drums? I'll leave you to deliberate that. They're different in terms of their upbringing and politics. The ANC is finding this out as well. I must just throw a little bit of politics in. They're ambitious. They're demanding. Loyalty. Employers are last on the list. They have high expectations. They have information in their heads at their fingertips. They want to be deployed to undertake productive tasks. Just recently, our department, that is the BSC program, engaged with the contracting sector to accommodate vacation training. I really must carry rubber mallets or non-rubber mallets around with me. But yes, the industry needs to wake up. Recognition these people demand recognition. Decorations, not earrings, associates and delegates. iPods, blackberries, blueberries, strawberries, raspberries. And laptops, well now tablets. I inserted tablets, by the way, because the article was published in 2007. 
Personal adornments, a survey conducted in the USA among 18 to 25 year olds, more than 30% have a tattoo. I'm not saying there's anything wrong with tattoos. And 33.3% have a piercing other than in the earlobe. Dress, funky t-shirts. Now you know why I wear different shirts and I don't wear suits and ties. Blazers, artsy jewelry, silly socks. And I just added hairstyle. Was one of our top uh, honours students, male students, recently acquired a new hairstyle. But it was thought-provoking. How do we relate to them? And now I'm going to hang a bit of NMMU dirty washing out here. But fortunately I have a new colleague, or we have a new colleague, correction, the former Chris Allen there. And we had to create new pull-up posters um, to use during career promotion, blah, blah, blah. And we have this PR intern in our school. We also have uh, more permanent staff in the faculty. But it was the usual, and I discovered courtesy of an advertising agency that produced a draft pull-up with visuals of people with hard hats standing behind the other lights or levels or whatever. And I had a triple SF. But we really need to be very careful how we promote the discipline, profession and practice of construction management. Because of, among other, Y generation and because we are actually competing with other programs such as, such as veterinary science, medicine, dentistry, although media studies is no longer sexy, chartered accountancy, etc. That's the reality, associates and delegates. Anyway, I then tasked Chris there. I said, Chris, Chris, please just sort it out. And Chris clearly understood. And we evolved this pull-up banner, which I think is, is fair in terms of what we are trying to achieve. Currently, our BSc program, 20% of registered students are women. Obviously, it needs to be at least 50. I mustn't give away too many of my thoughts. Because NMC were very concerned about their image, as any general contractor should be, because people are watching you, prospective clients are watching you, project managers are watching you, designers are watching you. And the way some contractors construct, I wouldn't let them lay one brick on my property. But anyway, one of the three principles of rethinking construction in the UK is in fact respect for people. And it's principle due to the role of people. And a poll conducted by the pollster YouGov in the UK, reported on in the Construction Manager 2003, addressed where would you like to work and why. Building sites were ranked second out of seven. Work is physically exhausting and sites are exposed to the elements predominated among 11 reasons. Followed jointly by sites are dangerous and the work culture is harsh, aggressive. Then building sites are dirty and they are. I have two focus areas when I visit construction sites, small, medium or large. Hard hats, the 14 reasons you should wear a hard hat. One of them is marketing and identification, another one is head protection. But I also look at toilets because they're fascinating. And of course my million dollar question is, would you like your mother to sit on that toilet? Don't answer it, of course. But that's one toilet. And uh, on a small project, and this is a toilet on a 3.5 billion rand project. Many of them look like that. You actually can hardly see the feces. Now, the question is, does Generation Y want to look at that? Do they want to be exposed to that? And who is responsible for cleaning up the mess? Excuse the pun. This featured in the CIDB's so-called health and safety status report. Um, clearly that worker could not fall off the vehicle. But that just gives you an idea of how our industry thinks. They are not well badges. And um, anyway, Terence Matola took the photograph. He's acknowledged here as always. And he was acknowledged in the status report. Outdoor dining on the 3.5 billion rand project. Think of Generation Y. And I included this because I took this photograph in the centre of Cuba in 2007, and it may be rudimentary, but it was an attempt. 
Whereas the construction canteen, please note, to the King's Cross Underground Station project in London is a clear indication of where the UK construction industry has positioned itself. I think Generation Y may sit in that canteen. And I think Generation Y would like to have a hot shower, particularly if they are a production worker. Some historical insights. In fact, the current paradigm was preceded by the then National Diploma in Construction Supervision and also in Construction Surveying, accompanied by, complemented by, the higher national diplomas. And then I think there was even a National Diploma in Plumbing Supervisor or Plumbing Supervision. And then, of course, the Technicons. We all know what happened. The Construction Supervision and Construction Surveying uh, programs were merged into the D National Diploma Building. Bridget addressed that. And then that was followed up by the BTEC's so-called specialization at the last minute. Fortunately, BIFSA and the then MBAs, due to the foresight of some notable individuals, contributed to the development and presentation of the BSc Building Management Program at the University of Pretoria in 62. Speak under correction, I think the first graduates were 66. Then further five programs were added, and of course that was at Natal, Wits, Free State, um, UCT, and University of Port Elizabeth. One, of course, which has fallen away. And Bob, of course, often waxes lyrical, and correctly so, at the major role the National Development Fund played in terms of tertiary construction management education. Not only in terms of funding, but regular liaison with the Technicons and the universities. The point I'm making, the then BIFSA and the NDF provide, how can I say, provided a major leadership function in the building construction sector of the South African construction industry. This is where people might start to shift in their seats. Well, that's a good thing. And that's why I provided you with my background because I was around. The Connie Surveyan profession became very confused, particularly in the 1990s in terms of their future. They started to masquerade as project managers and facility managers. And in fact, the SIIB was approached with a view to the ASA QS incorporating it. How would I know that? I was the president at the time. Hybridization then commenced in terms of the BSc programs, and the hybrid programs were then headed up by QSs. Professional recognition, I must state, that the SAIB endeavoured to secure such, especially in the 1980s, and possibly in the late 70s, but I served on the council in the 80s. And in fact, the DPW, I speak under correction, delivered the knockout punch in terms of the establishment of the SACPC and P in terms of Act 48 of 2000, which of course was opposed by the engineers and the connoisseurs. They apparently are construction project managers and construction managers. Why were these BSc building management programs or building administration, as it was then referred to, the UFS, um, developed? And it was stated in a BIFS report, and it's this report that I'm seeking. It was removed from my office. But people from the tools and other disciplines such as QS and engineers were not capable of managing construction the business of construction and projects. Due to, among other, the increasing scale, complexity, and you could add value of buildings and structures. What is construction management? I know the CIOB has this wonderful definition. And Bob and I had a meeting in Cape Town just last week to discuss the summit and issues. And as I said to Bob, the problem is when you're sitting on a plane, on a flight to wherever, invariably the person next to you will ask, what do you do? And I say, I'm a professor in construction management. And they say, engineering. And that's when I have a triple SF. And, and, and I say, no, 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 construction management. The management of the business of construction and projects. And of course, that's a succinct definition, which is the original definition attributable to, among other, those doyens of construction management literature, fellows Langford, Newcomb and Uri, the late Dave Langford. Of course, there are three levels of management, and that's what we have to contend with. 
or accommodate rather, in terms of operational, because people end up at the concrete face. And having been there, it's not quantity surveying, sitting in your air-conditioned office. The concrete face or the shutter face prior to that and the rebar and the pouring of concrete is hush, as they say in the New South Africa. It's not some remote control operation where you sit with a Sony PlayStation. The wind's blowing, there's dust, there's maybe rain, there are people shouting, there are tower cranes traversing, there's concrete dripping out of the bucket. That's the real world of construction. It's not for girl guides and boy scouts, or boy scouts and girl guides. Middle management, generally the functions and coordinating of projects, top management with strategic issues and overview of the organisation. It's a body of knowledge, and I have an issue with one or two of these heads of departments or professors at other universities. One even argued there isn't a body of knowledge. Well, there actually is. And the management gurus such as Louis Allen in professional management, the management profession, certainly recorded the five functions and 19 activities of management work. And people such as myself have developed that. They're also the well-known nine functions in an organization courtesy of business management authors and gurus. And then I certainly have expanded the number of project parameters from cost, quality and time. You know, health and safety is important because dead people cannot work and jobs get stopped if someone dies. And then the 11 construction resources, they should just mention that to emerging contractors. They might then not contract. And then, of course, there's surface competencies, 70 knowledge areas and 42 skills. But there are also core competencies. And yes, the surface competencies, their knowledge and skills are important, but it's these core competencies in terms of traits, self-concept and motives that are critical. And one of the biggest problems, just in, by the way, with emerging contractors is that one. They do not necessarily have the aptitude for construction. And that's important in terms of the people that we graduate and provide for the built environment in terms of its entirety. And of course, attitude as well, self-image, and then values, Bob. But yes, there are others relative to trait, self-confidence, team player, and ability to handle ambiguity, and of course, the, the motives there. Personality type is very important, and regrettably I couldn't lay my hands on some prior research conducted by myself. I never actually converted it into a conference paper. But personality type is critical in terms of the built environment, and more specifically the disciplines of construction management and construction project management profession. What my research in 1996 did determine was that construction managers need to be more extrovert than introvert, and more so than the other disciplines of quantity surveying and civil engineering and, I think, architecture. The implications in terms of what is construction management? Well, there needs to be a construction management culture in a department of construction management. That is if you have one. And furthermore, you need to evolve a construction management ethos. And that's what accreditation panels do focus on, certainly the Chartered Institute of Building during prior accreditation panel visits. The question is, do the programs we present actually result or achieve that? Our stakeholders, we have the CBE, we have the SACPCMP. They certainly have provided a home in terms of registration, which certainly has contributed to raising the status of the discipline, profession and practice of construction management and obviously construction project management. CETA, well, that's one of the new government's uh, legacies and they will be judged harshly. CETA is under administration. Imagine if the SACPC and P on the CIOB was under administration. Imagine if our department at the Nelson Mandela Metropolitan University was under administration. What would people think? But I must acknowledge that CETA does provide bursaries, 
at undergraduate level, not at honours level, for whatever reason. But yes, as Bob and I discussed during a scoping exercise, our discipline wasn't identified by CETA. I wonder why. Then the DPW, they certainly have contributed to the recognition of the discipline of construction management, construction project management. So to the CIDB, because of the requirement to register as a grade nine contractor, one of the requirements being, of course, registration with the SACPCMP. That is by employees. But the CIDB, of course, due to political realities, has had to promote emerging contractors. Now, I'm privileged in the sense that I've been exposed to numerous postgraduate studies, and for that matter, honours level studies pertaining to emerging contractors. These are not the people that were disadvantaged during the apartheid era, that were part of concrete crews and bricklaying crews and roofing crews. These are undertakers, school teachers, policemen, policewomen, seeking to take advantage. Now, there are no shortcuts. As I say, our BSc program delivers, after four years, an individual that has an idea of construction, a license to practice. But that's the starting point. Emerging contractors cannot expect to just acquire skills. There's one very easy solution. The universities of technology and their traditional universities. Go do the time. There's no gain without pain. And in that sense, the CIDB and the DPW, to a degree, undermine our program. And my argument, if that is the model, the Emerging Contractor Contractor Development Program model, then let's shut down our programs at the university, if that's the model. But I've heard via the grapevine that Pretoria has said, yes, they spent 250,000 Rand on those programs, that is per contractor, and there's no return. They could have rather spent the money sponsoring students at universities of technology and traditional universities. The CIOB, well, they've certainly been there in terms of accreditation and in terms of providing literature and a network, etc. And so too CIOB Africa. The MBSA, historically in, in the form of BIFSA, and so too the MBAs. Perhaps I'm biased because we have a very good working relation with the Eastgate Master Builders Association. Historically, current, and we will have such a good relationship in the future. The built environment, that's in its entirety. And yes, we do have relationships in the sense that many of our graduates end up working for multidisciplinary practices, not just construction project management practices. And of course, working for materials manufacturers and suppliers. Questions presenters of construction management programs should ask. Why are there separate councils for construction management policy? Why are there separate professional associations? Do students register for design programs and then qualify as an architect and engineer after a year of specialization? Would the ASAQS and SACQSP be delighted or accredited programs if a professor in construction management headed up a quantity surveying program? See, now I'm being provocative. Maybe not. It's a valid question. Why did the hybrid departments and then hybrid programs evolve? Was there an agenda? It's a question. Can a professor in quantity surveying champion two disciplines? Which discipline do the staff of hybrid departments champion? Why did the University of Pretoria, and you're here today, please tell Uncle Tinas, remove management from the department name? The BSc Building Management Program at the University of Pretoria was the first. It was held in high esteem by our university. In fact, sorry, but, but UPE ranked University of Pretoria and ourselves joint first. We respected Pretoria and Dries Alflisch that much. What construction management qualifications, undergrad and postgraduate, and construction experience do staff have? What is the nature of the consulting work that staff undertake? Is it complementary to construction? 
What specialist construction management status do staff have? The construction industry, don't tell them, Pierre, does he know what it is doing? Does he know what it needs to do in the future? Does he know what the world and the built environment will be like in 2050? Has it thought about this? Interesting, I am an architectural graduate registered for a PhD in construction management, and she's undertaking a future study, the built environment in 2050. I shouldn't have told you that. How does it manage the business of construction? Why does it resort to collusion? Can he not make money in an ethical manner? We've heard about Afri Sam Lafont. Fines is 162 million, 149 million. Who's paying for that? The South African taxpayer, clients. It's nauseating. Why does it kill so many people? Why does it undertake rework? Do they know how much rework they undertake? Pirello Miller and I, during a study which led to the publication of the Green Paper and then White Paper, determined that rework constitutes 13% of the value of construction completed in South Africa. So for every 1 million, 130,000 urinated down the toilet. It has a poor image. And if you don't believe me, I'll take you to 100 sites with a video camera and I'll shock you, something out of you. Do we, are we, do we provide direction to the built environment? Or do we perpetuate the laying of little pieces of burnt clay glued together with cement mortar as the Romans did over 2,000 years ago. We are also guilty. We need to turn the built environment upside down and get some blood into the heads of some of the people so they can start thinking. Whenever I ask delegates attending a health and safety seminar workshop, how much does a standard pre concrete curb weigh? You see people because they don't know, but they specify. They expect other people to handle it, to position it, to tamp it in final position. I won't tell you how much it weighs. That's your homework for tonight. And a solid clay brick. They don't know how much that weighs. But they'll go and position a pallet of bricks on a scaffold platform. And they don't even know how many bricks are on the pallet. They don't know how much each one weighs. It's a circus. No, that's an insult to the circus industry. So yes, do we provide direction to the contracting sector? Are we respected by the built environment? Are we respected by the contracting sector? The future. CPMs manage most major projects. It's a historical fact. Unlucky for the architects and engineers. Construction management is the gateway qualification for CPM. Construction management experience, I must add, is critical for eligibility to practice as a CPM. And drawings of construction project management such as Charles Israelite, by the way, concur therewith. Five to seven years minimum. The greater percentage of construction management graduates practices CPMs, part of your disappearing community bond. The new CIOB definition provides the indication of the future, and correctly so, Bridget and fellow trustees. Because yes, construction management graduates will manage the built environment. Provide we ensure this focus on management, then economics and science and technology. But our disciplines outgun the other, our discipline creation outguns the other disciplines. Architecture, interior design, landscape architecture, engineering, they lack the management and economics education in their undergraduate and honours programs. And they can stand on their head and eat bananas through their ears. That's a fact. So we are the people to lead the built environment. So um, what I'm alluding to, associates and delegates, let's not be too negative. But respect for people is critical. The construction industry can no longer afford to do business as it used to do. Disgusting toilets, lack of welfare facilities in general, pick up and drop off, Labour bond, gag, grab a graduate, you know, and then people phone me and then they still say, excuse the reference to race, do you have a black woman graduate? And I look under my chair while I'm on the phone. 
There's no gain without pain. And the contracting sector of the South African construction industry needs to return to the 80s, where they actually sponsored students at varsity and actually employed them during vacations from first year to evolve that construction management culture and ethos and to facilitate the integration of education and training. Furthermore, we need to change the way we design, procure and construct. Think about 2050, when we constructing space stations. Because that's what we're going to be doing. It's easy to construct bases for the Antarctic, the South African station. But space stations, are we prepared? And we need to produce competent, emotionally intelligent construction managers. Acknowledgements, and I have to a degree acknowledge BIFSA, including the NDF and MBAs for their catalytic role they played in the early 60s and probably in the late 50s for that matter. The MBSA and MBAs, the Department of Public Works, the CIDB, the SACPCMP and the CBE as the overarching council the Chartered Institute of Building, the then SAIB, and the doyens of construction management, in particular the founders of the BSC program, and I do have their names recorded somewhere. And then also Professor Dries Hartflisch, who as an associate, past president of the South African Institute of Building, has contributed substantially to the discipline, profession, and practice of construction management. And of course, Dries, I think, was one of those first students way back in 1962 and one of the first graduates in 1966. Thank you, Chair.